Okay, it turns out that blah, 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 blah. Good morning and welcome to LLT 121 Classical Mythology. It's raining today. It's cold and nasty. I thank you all for honoring me with your presence. It has become very trendy to watch Hercules on television. There's this show called Hercules, uh, Last Journeys, and it stars some really big, beefy guy, you know, flexing his pecs. And, and then there's Tawny Katane. Tawny, that's not her real name. Um, walking around and, you know, not a whole heck of a lot at all. And so something for the guys to watch while the ladies are drooling over Hercules. The basic plot. Does anybody know the basic plot of Hercules, the legendary journeys? Yes, Snakehead. Good. For, no, yeah, yeah, I've never seen it. How many of you don't read the National Enquirer? <laughs> I read it. What the hell? Okay, what are the pl what's the plot? I figured it was just to beat up people and save the poor people. Okay. She's a ringer. She's had comparative mythology. Um, yeah, go to some far off strange land, meet interesting people, and kill them. <laughs> meet monsters and kill them. That's one aspect of the heroic. As a present to you for honoring me with your presence on this miserable morning. One of my very favorite <clears throat> final exam questions, essay questions, is discuss the nature of the heroic in ancient Greco-Roman mythology. That's our secret. And if the people who didn't want to, you know, come into class today ever ask you what I said, did he say anything important, you just tell them, no. He just stood up there and talked the way he always does. One aspect of the appeal of the heroic is the so-called action aspect. Lots of fun aspects. Heroes are characters who do great things that humans can't do usually. Okay? And that is actually the starting point for my traditional lecture on the nature of the heroic. One definition of the heroic is a hero is bridge between human and divine. Oops. Let's consider for a moment the Weltanschauung of the ancient Greeks. It was way down there. The world is a cold and nasty place, full of toil and trouble. Then you die, and life gets even worse. You are trapped in eternity, rattling around like a BB in a beer can, with no hope for a happy afterlife, scads of depressing details, and no point for human existence. Yeah, I know, we have the mystery religions that developed as an answer to this. I know that we have the philosophical beliefs that developed as a response to this. But that does not change the fact that our, the average Bubacus, the average Jethra's life is actually pretty dull and boring and stuff like that. Do the gods and goddesses care about human existence? It didn't seem that way to the ancient Greeks, as Dr. Carawan, you know, brought up in his excellent discussion of Euripides as Hippolytus. When one deity gets mad at another, who suffers? Humans suffer. That's why Greek society needed heroes. The gods and goddesses were literally too far up to possibly have any hope, any care for human beings, any empathy, empathy for human beings. And the humans were too low to aspire to what the gods could do.
The gods and goddesses of the ancient Greeks being completely anthropomorphic show any number of human character flaws. Drunkenness, that's Dionysus, adultery, <laughs> all of them, rape, peevishness, lies, incest, cannibalism. Do you feel comfortable telling your young son, be like Zeus? Do you feel comfortable telling your daughter, your young ancient Greek daughter, be like Aphrodite? No, I don't think so. And so it comes that we have to have somebody to look up to. We wind up with the heroes. Here are two reasons for the appeal of the ancient hero to the extent that it's a bridge between human and divine. Number one, these heroes are human, part human, or part human, or at least they like humans. Example, an example of a human hero is Jason. Jason in the Argonauts' fame. Okay, so he's not much of a hero. He's kind of a jerk, as a matter of fact. But he counts. Part human. Hercules or Heracles. I use both names to try to confuse students as much as possible. Is half human. His mom was a mortal woman, and his dad is, of course, the all-popular Zeus. Or a hero can be a god who is demonstrated to like humans for some bizarre reason. Prometheus fits the bill very nicely here. All three of these characters are heroic. And number two, the heroes have appeal because of their entertainment value. You might ask, one, human, part human, or likes humans, two, entertainment value. You might rightly ask, you know, well, this includes just about everybody. How can you be a bridge between the human divine and the divine, linking the world of the humans, the divine, when you're actually like this big old goofy joke, this entertainment value story? Who are some heroes in American society? Does anybody have any hero they would care to share with us this lovely morning? Scott? Patrick Watt? Um, you have no heroes. Mitch, you have a hero? Phil? <laughs> Why don't I just go shoot myself? <laughs> Who's a sports hero? <laughs> I'm going to just leave this. That's fine. Any soldier is a hero, for example. That's right. That brings in, oh, how about George Patton? Colin Powell. George Washington. Okay, not a lot of entertainment value here, but these are examples of people, of humans, who are, you know, they're not gods or anything like that, but they achieve things. They have achieved things and brought goods to humankind that the average Bubacus and Jethro doesn't usually bring. Sometimes a hero can be an inspiring role model. Oh, who's a good role model? Colin Powell's a good role model. Started out literally a poor little kid living in New York City. And now, if he shows up and talks in your town, he gets 50,000 bucks or 200,000 bucks, some obscene amount of money for that. Sometimes a hero is a character who creates an emotional aura. I can think of no one better here in this context but the king, Elvis A. Presley. At this speaking, he has been dead now for 19 years. But 
Some say he's been dead for 19 years. I saw him over at OSCO the other day. That's because you read the National Enquirer. No, it's not because I read the National Enquirer. He had two or three kids in tow. He was looking a little wrecked and stuff like that. They must have 17 different Elvis imitators down in Branson. Why? Because people come to see him. Why? Because the passing of Elvis left a gap that has not been addressed. He did create an emotional aura. The same thing supposedly with the Beatles, but I don't believe it. Um, how about somebody who kills a lot of interesting monsters, goes off to far off lands? Who's a character in movies? Please tell me you people watch movies. Who goes off to far off lands, meets interesting people and or monsters and kills them? Carrie. Oh. <laughs> Matt? James Bond. Okay, James Bond's kind of a hero, but he's not bloody enough for me, you know what I mean? Conan? Conan. <laughs> I like that, Onan the Barbarian. He's got his dark glasses on and his little... <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry. Um, Conan the Barbarian. Rambo. How many of you have ever watched a Rambo movie? Why did you watch a Rambo movie, Erica? For the fine plot? For the sensitive acting of Sylvester Stallone? It could have been like there was some guy you were going with and we had to go see it or something like that. Very good. I was talking with Dr. Spisek this morning and I was telling him, well, you know, I never have watched a Rambo movie. Rambo is a character created by a professor of literature at the University of Iowa, my alma mater. No fooling. Some twit with a receding hairline and a beard and a tweed jacket sitting up there in his office hour writing about Rambo. <laughs> Rambo, <laughs> and that's what happened. Rambo is basically this guy. You parachute him into the middle of the Black Forest in Germany, let's say deep, dark, scary place, right? Where he is surrounded by the Iraqi Republican Guard. <laughs> they have tanks and rocket launchers, you know, and machine guns and nukes and, you know, 15,000 guys, you know, they got him surrounded and here's Sly, Sylvester Stallone, Rambo, in his little loincloth. <laughs> He's got, you know, some rocks. He's got three big rocks <laughs> and a stick. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe uh, half a bottle of Snapple. <laughs> so much for the first five minutes of the movie. You giggle. But I ask you, what's the one thing you know for sure? How's the story going to end? He's, Rambo's going to win. You look at the Iraqi National Guard. They haven't been fed for weeks. They're mad. <laughs> Saddam's been beating them again. Um, <laughs> And you know that he's Arnold Schwarzenegger, ah, Sylvester Stallone. And not once, not once has Sylvester Stallone ever obliged me by dying at the end of a Rambo movie. Not in Rambo 1, 2, 3, or 27, where they wheel him out in his wheelchair in his oxygen tank. And, Those things are lethal. Huh? Those wheelchairs are lethal. <laughs> You've seen Rocky 27, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know that Arnie's going to make it out one piece. Not once does he die at the end of the movie, or Sly or Jean-Claude, or what have you. Why is that? It's all in how you tell the story. Um, other characters are people who rose up from great, other heroic types. Anybody who is a mom is automatically heroic. Well, yeah, I mean, you make a face at me like that, Jarrett, and I know that, you know, I, I, I feel the same way. But my mom says that any mom is a, anybody who's actually given birth is a hero, and based on the stories I've heard, I, yes, mom, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's true, mom, and stuff like that. Rescues innocent people, leads innocent people out of danger, like Martin Luther King, perhaps, something more than human. I guess wear a cool looking outfit, uniform like Superman or the other comic book heroes. The ancient Greeks had their share of heroes too. It's very amusing to me 
to find out what's become of Hercules, and that's what Dr. Spisak will be talking about on Wednesday and Friday in our next two exciting classes. <clears throat> Let me read off my lecture notes for a second. By virtue of being partly human, the ancient heroes have considerable appeal. Because heroes are bound by all the limitations, such as death and suffering, that beset real life humans, they were that much more easy to identify with. And they could be assumed to feel for humans and care for humans in a way that ancient deities very seldom did. Often the heroes address themselves to peculiarly human dilemmas, the struggle to civilize humankind, the problem of preserving order in a hostile universe, the search for immortality. Even when the, the hero is 100% divine, as is the case with Prometheus, there's no question of whom the hero is siding with in the battle between deities and humans. Prometheus, if you'll recall, is siding with the humans. Given the peculiarly short, nasty, and brutish nature of life in ancient civilization, the hero becomes a specially dear character to the human heart. In the instance of Heracles, otherwise known as Hercules, the hero even wins full divine status as the reward for his sufferings and labors. And that just might provoke some hope in humans. Not to give away Dr. Spisak's subject matter, but Hercules was born the child of Zeus and a mortal woman and he had it tough from day one. Nobody ever gave Heracles anything. Heracles is the sort of hero that I would term a blue-collar hero. Even though a son of Zeus, he had to work, struggle, fight, claw, and suffer for whatever he got, and he was rewarded at the end with immortality, a reward for struggles which are basically human struggles. One particularly Greek offshoot I need to mention here is that the hero is often associated with, God bless you, one particular community. That is to say, Jason is going to turn out to be the hero of Iolcus, that Theseus is the hero of Athens. Every little town has its own hero, much as St. Louis has Ozzie Smith such as Springfield might have John Q. Hammonds or Carol Jones as a local hero, a person of local prominence, okay, who is perceived as being up there above the normal Bubacus and Jathra and is revered and respected accordingly. The one exception to this rule is again Hercules who originally is a hero, local hero of the city of Argos, but eventually becomes the Panhellenic hero. That is to say, it doesn't mean that he goes to all the fraternity and sorority houses on Friday night having a beer at each place and stuff like that. It means that he is regarded by all Hellenic, all Greek cities as common property. As a matter of fact, he was so important that even the Romans got a piece of the Heracles action. <clears throat> yes? I'm just curious, is there any indication or evidence, one way or the other, to say that the stories about Hercules had any basis in uh, any type of reality? No. You listening there, you humorous? There was a, um, <clears throat> write this down, this is a present from me to you. Mark's question was, was there basically a prototype, right, to distill it? Was there a prototype for Hercules? Yeah, probably. The ancient Greek philosopher Euhemerus 
have this theory about the gods. It's called euhemerism. Euhemerism means nice day. I mean, this guy's name meant have a nice day in ancient Greek. He believed that Zeus, he believed that Zeus was originally, Mark, because it was Mark who asked this question, um, believed that Zeus was originally this really high-powered great king. And as Zeus's reputation became greater, as generation of genera after generation of people, you know, um, talked about the great deeds of King Zeus, pretty soon Zeus became regarded as a hero, and then finally as a deity. Okay, um, and for those of you who are familiar with Mesopotamian mythology, Gilgamesh also gives an excellent example of that, right? Uh, well, uh, to Mark specifically, in line with this question, I've read uh, uh, some rather lengthy accounts of uh, all the trials of Hercules in each, in each case. Uh, they uh, represent uh, one um, session of the zodiac for each sign in astrology. Mm -hmm. And they do a very good job uh, uh -huh. explaining each individual case. Yeah, I, it, these things, you know, have tremendous appeal to people who are searching for truth or searching for information, searching for some handle on the universe in any number of different ways. But you humorous would say, in answer to your, your specific question, Mark, yeah, these stories about Hercules are in all likelihood a bunch of stories that were told about, you know, great King Phil or Queen Elizabeth the Terrible, you know, or Hughes the Bald and eventually were retold and kind of started to circle around one character who was more exciting than the whole bunch. So that's the only thing you have to go on that, is some dead guy story. Well, it doesn't make all that, well, no, no. I would say that it makes a certain amount of sense if you consider the way that stories are passed around in our own society. Um, the story that you know happened to your little brother because you saw it and did it to him can get told on you if he persuades enough people that he actually did it to you. Do you see what I mean? Exactly. Or the great adventures of this guy that you heard about. Well, nobody knows about, you know, nobody up in my hometown knows about Mitch. You know, and his great adventures of fighting his way from one end of Cherry Street down to the other. It's a great story, but there's this guy in my mythology class, his name's Mitch. You know, Mitch is pretty laid back. You know, no, 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 no. I'll tell it about me. <laughs> or I'll tell it about somebody who I want to pump up. Do you know that H. Ross Perot one time fought his way up and, you know, there are any number of reasons for stealing a story about person X and telling it about person Y. Okay, very excellent. <clears throat> oh, here's good, something good. <clears throat> Heroic legends also have discernible entertainment value. That just means if it ain't entertaining, nobody's going to pay any attention to it. For all of the profound things, like you point out, Ray, uh, that, you know, can be derived from study of myths and legends, psychological insights, intellectual insights, history, sociology. The fact is that these stories survive because they're entertaining. If they aren't entertaining, they become forgotten very quickly. Well, yeah. Exactly, as one of my relatives once asked me, you know, complained about me, why is it, Joe, that you always remember the stupid things that everybody else does, <laughs> but not the ones you do? Because I'm not that big of an idiot, if you see what I mean. Of course I remember every embarrassing thing my little sister did when she was a little kid. So yeah, a lot of the stories just don't get remembered because they're not really that good. Wait until you guys get nice and old like me. Okay, entire years of your high school experience will drop out because they weren't that interesting. But the really cool interesting things, did like the Chinese fire drill where this guy stopped in front of us, ran out of the car, 
and punched my friend who was driving right in the mouth while he was sitting there. I remember that very vividly. It was really cool because it was the senior banquet, and there was this girl that I had had this mad crush on for six years, and we were all drinking. I remember that one really good, but the day-to-day -day humdrum, <laughs> you know, long since gone. Depending on how well the story was told and on how well it addresses human concerns, a heroic legend can last, could last for centuries. As it has in the case of Hercules, one culture can steal it from another. Hercules in particular is a real hoot. I mean, Hercules, in ancient Greek mythology, he makes his first appearance in the Iliad of Homer. Either book four, book five, or somewhere else. He's mentioned in passing, he shot Hera in the left breast with a three-barbed arrow. Not a nice guy, is he? Not the sort of guy you'd hold up to your kids as a culture hero. You know, the technical term for shooting Hera in the left breast with a three-barbed arrow is hubris, the punishment being death or something that makes you wish you were dead. Then he sleeps with the 50 daughters of King Thespius. On 50 nights, or maybe one night, there's both versions of the story told. Um, he kills his first wife. You know, this isn't the sort of kid you want to raise your son up to be, is it? I should hope not. Um, but out of all the great leaders that the Romans and Greeks produced, the great literary figures, the great artists, who is it that shows up on popular television? Hercules. He has his own TV show. I can't wait till he has his own movie. Oh, joy. I remember that. I could sing that song if I weren't on camera. He had, was it, he the one who had this little ring that would pop open and he would take a pill? Now that's really great. Could you imagine a TV show today, you know, where this guy takes a pill and gives him the strength of 10 ordinary men or at least helps him to feel it? Um, <laughs> I read the news today, oh boy, and I found out that the only sure bet for a worldwide blockbuster movie today is not a sensitive, artistic movie about a woman getting into, in touch with herself in a man's world. That's called chick movie, okay? Nor is it the story of Jarrett, this guy who is from Springfield, Missouri, and he works at a get-and-go. <laughs> You know, where there's not a movie about how he cleans out the cooler, you know. He ventured, I was alone in the cooler. You know, nobody cares about that stuff. Well, we got to have is some really burly looking guy, or now we get to have burly looking women, I guess. There's Exena, right? Is she this burly looking woman who walks around and kicks butt and stuff like that? Oh, Hercules is hilarious. Hercules, he even talks to women and listens to them. I mean, somebody was telling him something like, Hercules, I think you need to get in touch with your inner child. And, yeah, it's Hercules get in touch with inner child. You know, and, nah, nah, that's bogus. A real life Hercules wouldn't do that. He would throw her over her shoulder, drag her off into the weeds or something. <laughs> but the only way you can have a worldwide blockbuster movie today is Arnie, Sylvester, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yes, the heck the heck with art and stuff like that. It just goes to show you nothing has changed. Why did these myths survive? Because they were so very entertaining. And Mark, the boring ones, they either were made interesting really quick or they went away. Other theories for the entertainment of value of classical mythology heroes. One of my favorite ones is the dynasty theory. Dynasty, was it many years ago, <laughs> when I was first teaching this class, there was a show called Dynasty. Oddly enough, it's still one of the most popular television shows internationally. It's a story, isn't it, about, or I mix it up with Dallas, but it basically is Dallas. It's a story about rich people and what miserable lives they have because they're incapable of having, you know, having, experiencing true love or true happiness. It's just like the soap operas, right? 
um, where, you know, the, how many soap operas are there about people who are dirt poor? <laughs> they, they live in a dirt floor shanty, you know, who would watch that soap opera? No, they're always heart surgeons and, you know, live in big palatial abodes and they're always worried about who's going to leave the money to whom. They're all, they're all of them doctors, lawyers, or race car drivers, or all three at the same time. And I, myself, to the extent I love to watch soap opera, I don't really watch them that often. I used to watch All My Children because it was fun to watch rich people suffer. I mean, really, who really cares about Oprah's weight? I mean, if I were as rich as Oprah Winfrey, I would eat bacon until I exploded and not care what anybody thought. Okay? Or if I were Eliz Elizabeth, T if I were Michael Jackson, I would have an extra eye cut out in the middle of my forehead. And I would say, hey, you don't like it, that's tough. As the great Cher was once, now there's somebody I really respect. Does, she's a hero to me. Does whatever she wants and says to heck with it. She once said of her copious plastic surgery, they are my breasts, and if I want to wear them on my back, I will wear them on my back. Now that's the attitude. Why do people care about Michael Jackson and his interesting personality? Why do people care about Madonna's love life and stuff like that? Because we want to watch them suffer. Why do people care about the British royal family? What is the function of the British royal family? Exactly, but why do people in the tabloids want to read about why... Here's a... <laughs> Prince Charles, <laughs> you know, the latest status of his um, divorce with Diana. I mean, who cares? People get divorced every day. Because here's a guy who makes his living by going, ooh, you know, and not yawning at festivals and stuff like that. That's not a bad gig if you can get it. I like watching him suffer. Oprah could buy this, pardon? Oprah could buy this whole university. And here she is worrying about her weight. I wish I had that kind of problem. Let her try worrying about her weight on my salary. <laughs> and another popular reason for um, these heroic stories is wish fulfillment. One of the reasons why these stories appeal to people is wish fulfillment. You are all at this moment trapped in the bodies and in the lives of college students at a university in the United States of America. <clears throat> it's pretty good life. It's worse than, it's better than like um, being a garbage man in Sarajevo or something like that. It beats that, right? But it's pretty much by the numbers and stuff like that. Who wants to watch a movie about Jarrett? who is the clerk at the get-and-go on South Campbell, or the most excellent adventures of Carrie as, uh, you got a job? Okay, well, you sell um, clothing over at the Gap. Or, you know, would you like some donuts with that, sir? <laughs> yeah. You know, that would wear itself out very quickly, wouldn't it? I mean, who wants to plug themselves into the life of Jarrett? <laughs> you know, man, I wish that were me cleaning out that cooler. I can tell you there'd be a lot of Snapple going down the old hatcheroonie. <laughs> yeah. But now Rambo, now that's pretty cool. Remember where we left Rambo? He was in the, um, he was in the Black Forest, and he finds a rocket launcher that somebody dropped. He picks up a rock, throws it, so ooh! And he picks up the rocket launcher, and it's got lots of rounds in it. Boom! Boom! I mean, who hasn't empathized with that? Who wouldn't? Have you ever driven a car in Springfield? Have you ever wondered about how nice it would be to have a front-loading and rear-loading rocket launcher on your car? You know, some not-nice person, you know, refuses to run the red light in front of you. 
So you just press a button, boom, <laughs> and hey, you're clear all the way down to Battlefield Mall. <laughs> I like that. Or how about, you know, like Elvis? I mean, Elvis in the early movies, the slender, svelte Elvis who would walk in, <laughs> and all the girls would start drooling. You know, now I'm fat and paunchy and bald, and... <laughs> You know, when people see me coming, they look at my wife and say, she could have done better for herself. Who wouldn't? What fat, graying, paunchy, middle-aged dude such as myself would not want to empathize with this beefy slab of muscular bulk, you know, who parachutes into the black forest and shoots things with his rocket launcher? Or what you know, 40-ish middle-aged woman would not, in her right mind, would not want to be like Madonna, who just like, okay, I'll take this one and that one and this one, I'll have fun, then I'll throw them out and get another six-pack of 18-year-olds or something like that. And if I want to have a kid and it's not going to have a, you know, without a husband, hey, tough, see if I care, you know, and the women think, Wow, that's really cool. Not that I'd care to try that at home, but it's fun to imagine myself doing that. We wouldn't want to be these people permanent on a permanent basis. Wouldn't want to be Madonna. I don't want to be Elvis because he's dead. But <laughs> it'd be fun to be like him for a while. It would be fun to be a baseball player or a hockey goalie for a while. It'd be fun to be a rock star for a while, but then you get tired of all the drugs and sex and <laughs> um, wild partying and adulation and money and fast cars <laughs> and stuff like that. Believe me, it gets really boring after a while. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I want to sell you, and I've got a bridge I want to sell you after that. Finally. In order to help you compare the careers of the heroes we will study this semester, I have invented, myself, this device called the Herometer. It's not flawless device. That is to say, even though I invented it, it could stand some improvement. It has eight categories. Most heroes stack up one way or another on each of these eight categories. Not all of them have all eight categories going on. Not all of them have the same answer. But for what it's worth, and it would be worth a certain point value, seeing as how I invented the herometer, and it's a very useful way to compare, hint, hint, nudge, nudge one, one hero to another. Did I tell you who made the herometer up? It was me. Hero is of divine birth on one side. True, for example, of Heracles. His dad is Zeus, his mom is a mortal woman. S sometimes um, a hero doesn't have any divine parent at all. This one isn't always applicable, but it usually is. Number two, hero involved in fantastic events early on. Not necessarily as early as Heracles. I mean, Hercules had to strangle baby snakes right after he was born. I mean, that's pretty early. Uh, most of the heroes are about 16, 17, 18 years old. Very seldom do you get some 42-year-old insurance salesman going on a quest to the end of the world to bring something somewhere. Hero faced with opposition. 
The opposition is important because try to imagine a Rambo movie with no bad guys. Try to imagine, you know, Sylvester Stallone starring as Rambo in a movie with no bad people whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> you know. The opposition, and let me spell it correctly, is usually is a proverbial bad guy. Very briefly. No, nah, you guys owe me a couple minutes anyway. You may remember a time when the bad guys were always communist Russians. But then, the Russians weren't communists anymore, so we couldn't have Russian communists being the evil bad guys. So it became Arabs. This was right around the time of the oil embargo. Darn Arabs! have all this gas and then it turned out that there were lots of people in the United States who were leading productive and contributing lives and stuff like that who were Arabs and they didn't appreciate this very much so it became South Africans the South Africans were the white people who kept the black people suppressed through the system known as apartheid which was bad but then they let Nelson Mandela out of jail, and he's the president so, of South Africa, so we can't womp on them anymore. So they changed it to South American drug dealers. And that's what it is now, pretty much, isn't it? It's still drug dealers. They're still the bad guys. It's hard to find positive things to say about a drug dealer. <laughs> Maybe. Um, uh, now, Ray, you be quiet. <laughs> My point being that whoever is the biggest bad guy at any point in a culture's history is probably their biggest bad guy in real life. So much for the opposition. Wait till you find out who the number one opposition in most Greek heroic myths is. It's the Amazons. Uppity women. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to that later. Hero becomes hero by overcoming opposition. That makes enough sense. Hero has love interest. That's number five. Because who wants to watch a Rambo movie in which there is, shall we say, no female scenery? I mean, the women get to sit around and watch sly flex and stuff like that. You know, the guys want to see something cute, too. So some great actress comes out in a little tongue bikini and just juggles through there, you know. She's in there. She's always in there. Doesn't Xena have some boyfriend or something like that? No. Isn't there some... Okay, well, he thinks that Xena's gay, and she thinks that Zena, women are more intellectual than men. You can take it out to the parking lot after class. Um, Hero has a helper. You know, just as um, the skipper had Gilligan. Um, Hero has labors one or more great ones and finally the hero confronts death in some way or another sometimes the hero like Hercules becomes immortal sometimes the hero goes on a catabasis a round trip to the underworld to find out what goes on after you die and sometimes the hero just keels over and dies I count that as a number eight also. Very often in these heroic legends, you're going to say, why is it that he had to do that? I'm going to say, well, it fills in number six on the dreaded herometer. That's why he had to do it. Jeremy. Do the helpers sometimes become the other heroes themselves? Very seldom. Very seldom. I, no. Bring that up again when we talk about Jason and the Argonauts, because it's going to turn out that Hercules is a helper to Jason, and he's a helper for about one myth, and then he gets tossed out of the myth because he'd steal the show.